Well, welcome back to our continuing Bible study series on the names of God. As I mentioned, we've been getting to know God better by getting to know the names of God better. And when we study the names of God, we get to experience God in a much more personal way than by just learning Bible history or Baptist doctrines, as an example. Um, but so far on our journey, we have come to know God as Elohim, Yahweh, El Elyon, the Most High God. And last Sunday morning, we, we learned about Adonai. God the Master. This morning we will continue our continuing Bible study series with a new name of God and we can find this morning's name of God in Genesis chapter 16. We're going to read the entire chapter which is 16 verses. Um, so God's Holy Word in Genesis chapter 16 verses 1 through 16. God's Holy Word declares, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. That's some of the saddest words I read in the Bible right there, by the way. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had uh, dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Now let us look back to Genesis chapter 16, verse 13. And Hagar called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Now, pretty much everyone um, assembled together here this morning or watching online is familiar with this Bible story. It is the story of Ishmael, the mortal enemy of Israel. It is a very sad story of Abram's lack of faith in God and his precious promise. And Abram's sin, that is still causing trouble for God's people even today, more than 4,000 years later. For those of you who may not be familiar with this Bible story, let me very briefly summarize it here for you. Abram, the father, the patriarch, if you will, of the Jewish nation, was growing old, but even though God had already promised Abram not just a son, but descendants beyond number, and yet Abram remained childless. Years before, God had promised Abram that his descendants would number as the dust of the earth. That would make a great nation. But how do you make a great nation without even just one child? So Abram had grown a little bit impatient and, 
and listening to his wife Sarai, decided to work out God's promise on his own terms. Sarai gave to Abram her Egyptian handmaiden, Hagar, for the purpose of trying to have a child. And to make a long story short, well, Abram got Hagar pregnant. Oddly enough, Hagar suddenly copped an attitude toward her master, Sarai, thinking that she was now somehow better than her simply because she was pregnant with Abram's child. Now, obviously, Sarai did not appreciate being disrespected by her own servant, so Sarai got tough on Hagar, who then ran away to escape Sarai's mistreatment. Now, while out in the wilderness, Hagar just happened to stumble into the angel of the Lord, who promised Hagar that God would multiply her seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Note what Hagar said in response in Genesis 16, 13. And Hagar called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Imagine a runaway servant woman all by herself in the wilderness, probably hungry, probably scared. And to make matters even worse, she was pregnant with someone else's child. She must have felt somewhat, well, alone and lonely because God saw her when she felt no one else did. Hagar then declared, you are the God who sees me. And she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. I, I love this story, by the way. This was the first time in God's holy word that we find this name of God, El Roy. And it is also the only time that this name of God is found anywhere in God's holy word as well, by the way. The, this first part of the name El, as we already know, is an abbreviation for the name Elohim. And Roy, or Roi, if you prefer, means who sees. So El Roy means the God who sees. However, it does not just refer to, shall we say, a pagan God who, like a telescope, sees faraway planets and space. Rather, El Roy is the God who sees absolutely everything going on in our lives today. Consider how Job 34.21 describes this attribute of God. In Job 34.21, Job said, For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. Friends, God sees you right now, and he knows everything that is going on in your life. But listen, more importantly, God knows what life is doing to you. When you feel God doesn't care about you, keep in mind two things about this name, El Roy. First of all, remember the revelation of El Roy. To discover what is revealed about God in this name, we must once again use our old friend, the rule of first mention which I explained a few weeks back. As I already mentioned, the first time we find the name El Roy is right here in Genesis chapter 16 and verse 13 when Hagar called God, Thou God seest me. As we already learned, this Bible story of Hagar revolves around a lapse of faith by Abram and his wife Sarai. God promised to bless Abram, multiplying his descendants beyond number and making them a great nation. However, Abram is now 85 years old and Sarai is 75, well past what we would consider childbearing age. With no children, Abram became very discouraged. And instead of waiting in faith for God to fulfill his promise, Sarai told Abram to commit adultery with her Egyptian handmaiden, Hagar. Abram, like other of the saints such as David, Elijah, and even Peter had lapses of faith. Now why did God tell us about these lapses of faith? I mean simply put, we would never be able to relate to these um, saints of the faith, if you will, um, if they were perfect because none of us are perfect. However, despite their failures, faults, and flaws, God still used them. We can therefore know that God can still use us too in spite of our failures, faults, and flaws as well. That's why I love what God's holy word tells us about one of the greatest of all the prophets in the Old Covenant. In James chapter 5 and verse 17, God's holy word tells us, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. 
that means that Elijah was a human who made mistakes and disappointed God, just like we do. And yet, God still used the prophet Elijah. One reason why I believe that God's holy word is the inspired, inerrant, and infallible holy word of God is because it tells us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about its characters within the stories. If I had written the Bible, I would probably have tried to gloss over the failures, faults, and flaws of the the good guys while highlighting their better qualities, traits, and characteristics. And, of course, just the opposite with the bad guys. You know, in, in Hollywood, they generally, you know, the, the bad guys are always the uglier ones. And then the good guys are always the more handsome, you know, like me. Um, but so the bad guys always look like Philip or Brother Tim. Um, but that's the way the world likes to portray. And that's if, if I were writing the Bible, surely that's the way any of us would write it as well. You know, we would want the, the bad guys to, to all be the flawed one, but the, the heroes Abraham, David, all these, they would be flawless. But that's not the way God's holy word um, it describes the people we read about. He tells us the truth. You know that if he's willing to tell us the truth about these people, we can trust that he's telling the truth about everything else as well. I, I love how God's holy word doesn't gloss over the fact that we are mere mortals full of sin. We are, after all, sinners. And for those of us who have accepted Christ, we are sinners saved by grace. A great verse to remember when you have a lapse of faith is Psalm 103, 14. 100 verse, 103, verse 14. For God knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. See, God knows that we make mistakes, sometimes big ones, but yet God can still use us. But meanwhile, back at the Bible ranch, following Sarai's suggestion, Abram committed adultery with Hagar, resulting in Hagar being pregnant. Now I wonder if Sarai and Abram just tried to justify their sin by saying something like, well, we know God wants us to have a child, so we're just helping God out. Like God doesn't have the power to do it on his own. So I've got to help God do what he wants to, uh, to do. Sound familiar? Sure it does. Christians are constantly trying to justify their sins just like that. We're just trying to do something good for God. That's why we're committing the sin against God. What? That doesn't make sense at all. But that's the way we Christians are. We always want to justify our sins. However, when Hagar became pregnant, she was no longer just Sarai's handmaiden. She was now also the mother of of Abram's child, and even worse, Abram's firstborn male child. For rather obvious reasons, this apparently caused no shortage of conflict between Hagar and Sarai. When Sarai complained to Abram about it, Abram told her to do whatever she felt was right with Hagar. Therefore, Sarai dealt hardly with her, and Hagar fled into the wilderness where she would probably have died had it not been for God who saw her. Note that it was not just an angel. Rather, this was the angel of the Lord, Lord in all four caps, Yahweh, who found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. This implies that it was probably God himself. When God first appeared to Moses at the burning bush, do you remember what God's holy word first called God? The angel of the Lord. We are Each of these two events is an example of what is called a theophany which is an earthly manifestation of God. That is why Hagar later called the angel El Roy, or thou, God, seest me. There in the desert, God told Hagar that she was pregnant with a son and would have many descendants. God then told her, thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. This name ends with El, an abbreviation for Elohim. Now remember, in God's holy word, um, names that have El in it, beginning or ending, um, means it has something to do with God. And in this case, Ishmael means God hears. But note what else God told Hagar in Genesis 16, verse 12. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. 
Ishmael was the firstborn son of Abram, but he was not the son of promise. About 14 years later, when Abraham was 100 years old, God fulfilled his promise, and Abraham had a son by Sarah, whom they named Isaac. Ishmael's descendants are called Arabs, and Isaac's are called Jews. Arab countries are those whose primary language is Arabic, including present-day countries such as Kuwait, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Jordan. Jews and Arabs are both descendants of Abraham, but what did God promise Abraham in Genesis 15, 18? In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now the western border, the river Egypt, which many uh, of us believe is, is the Nile, would include a portion of Egypt. The eastern border, the Euphrates River, would include Jordan, about one half of Syria and one third of Iraq. The Arabs believe that land is God's promise to them through Ishmael while the Jews know that it was promised to them through Isaac. The conflict between these Jews and Arabs in the Middle East today dates back all the way to Ishmael and Isaac. Although what Abraham did with Hagar may have been considered an accepted practice in his culture, it was not acceptable to God and he would not bless Abram's sin. Like all plans contrary to God's will, Sarah and Abraham's sinful scheme soon turned sour. Abraham did not have a Bible, so he had to learn from experience what truth that we now find in Psalm 127 and verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. One little sin has resulted in more than 4,000 years of problems. One little sin. That's all it took. And that sin was not the adultery, by the way. What was the sin that Abraham committed? Disobedience. It was a lack of faith. He just didn't do what God said to do because he didn't trust God. 4,000 years of pain and suffering on this world because of one little lack of faith. But friends, when you feel like God does not care, remember the revelation of El Roy. Because God sees. I love that. God sees. You know, last Sunday, um, Brother Steve sang a song, His Eye is on the Sparrow. <laughs> I love that song. And, and as I, 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 I had to look it up. I couldn't remember the woman's name, but... As, Ethel Waters, I think the name was. I love the way she sings it, but um, his eye is on the sparrow. I love that. You know, if God can see the little bitty sparrow, you think he can't see us as well? Praise God. Thou God seest me. Amen. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. And his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Amen. Th th and but also remember the application of El Roy. The name of God reveals that God cares about each and every one of us, and he has a purpose for our pain. When we are first introduced to God as El Roy, what does he tell Hagar to do in Genesis chapter 16, verse 9? And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. Oh, that got to hurt right there. I just ran away from her. She's mean to me. Sometimes in life we face terrible times of troublesome testing and tribulation. Life can be tough and unfair. We, of course, do not care to deal with these problems and would prefer to run away from them, just like Hagar tried to do here. There are times when we must live or work in situations where we are not treated fairly or equitably. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery to the promised land, he faced much superior enemies. His enemies were trained warriors, while the Hebrews were only slaves. In spite of this, Moses sang a song of praise to the God of Israel. What did Moses say in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 10? He found in him a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. 
He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. The phrase apple of his eye implies extremely um, dear and close. During their time in Egypt, after Joseph died, the Israelites certainly did not feel like they were the apple of God's eye. But they always were. God's holy word is basically a record of the fact that God always has a reason for allowing bad things to happen to good people. After saying Israel was the apple of God's eye, look at how Moses described God in, in chapter uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 11. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. The Lord Elroy sees us and sometimes exercises his loving care over us like an eagle. By stirring up the nest with its wings, the eagle thrusts the young eaglets out into the air to teach them to fly. But it does not leave them to fall to their deaths. If the eaglets cannot fly, the eagle will swoop down and catch them on her wings. I like that. And this Look it up. This is a true story. But in a similar way, El Roy saw all the abuse of the Israelites in Egypt, but allowed it to stir them out of their nest and on, and on to the promised land. Had the Israelites' lives in Egypt been easy, they would have never been willing to leave the wealth and security of the most powerful nation on earth to endure the desert and then fight far superior enemies to inhabit their promised land. There's an old saying, people don't change until the pain of continuing as they are exceeds the pain of change. God had to allow the pain of Egypt to exceed the pain of the desert and fighting for the promised land before the Israelites would be willing to leave Egypt. Not only did God want the Israelites out of Egypt, but he also, and more importantly, wanted them in the promised land. Sometimes, when it seems God does not see or care Maybe God is simply allowing bad things to happen to us to get us into something better, not just out of something bad. Maybe God has allowed something bad in your life to get you into church or into a new group of Christian friends. Perhaps right now you are having a tough go at it and it seems like God does not see you. If so, maybe you need to pray that wonderful prayer found in Psalm 17 and verse 8. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. When you feel God does not care, remember the name of God, El Roy. God sees you. Friends, when we feel most invisible and forgotten by everyone else, we can remember that God does see us. God witnesses our struggles and comes alongside us. After all, if God sees the sparrows and, and takes care of them, how much more does God care for us in our greatest times of need? Of course, we can see many examples of God seeing those who society chooses not to see. Think about Christ Jesus. He healed the lepers, the blind men, and even the demon-possessed. Christ Jesus even sat down and had a conversation with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. In fact, it seems that throughout all of God's holy word, God chooses to see the unseen. Sometimes it can be easy to think that God has forgotten us or that maybe God just does not see us. But according to this name of God, El Roy, absolutely nothing could be further from the truth. Let me ask you this. Do you ever write down your prayers? Do you then ever go back over your old prayers from years before and see how God has moved in your life since then? I suggest that you try it, and I promise that you will see that God does see you. It is in the dark of the night that we may feel as though God has abandoned us. Or maybe it is in the midst of the storm that you feel as though God may have fallen asleep in the back of the boat. But friends, when you look back over past troubles in our lives, we can see that God was always there. And even though maybe God did not do what we wanted Him to do, we can absolutely know that God saw us in those times of trouble. And because God does not change, if God saw us then, then God still sees us today and God will still see us tomorrow. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30, God's holy word tells us that God knows even the number of the hairs on our heads. 
for some of us, maybe that is even easier than others to be able to count, but what this means for us is that out of the billions of people in this world, God knows more about you than you do. Consider who Christ Jesus came to seek out and to save. See, Christ Jesus came for us, the lowest of the low down, no good, good for nothing, dirty, rotten sinners. Christ Jesus was accused of hanging out with prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners. Christ Jesus saw those people that others considered too dirty to see. And he healed them. He spoke with them. He dined with them. And Christ Jesus loved them and died and rose again for not just them, but for us. We can know, therefore, that Christ Jesus can do the same with us. No matter how bad we think we are, God sees us and God loves us. In fact, even in our darkest, most desperate moments, similar to Hagar, God sees us. But you know what? There's another aspect of this name of God that I find quite comforting. Understand that Hagar was an unwilling victim in this Bible story. Now, we do not know how young she was, but she was most likely still relatively young. Does, does anyone know where Hagar came from, by the way? Egypt. How did they get her? Very good. That was a trick question, but uh, absolutely correct. We can read in Genesis 12 how when Abram gets to uh, Egypt, he lied about who his wife was. Pharaoh, to make up for his mistake of trying to marry a married woman, gave a bunch of servants, male servants and female servants, to Abram. Most likely, this is where she came from. She would have been pretty young back then, so she was just a slave. She didn't want to be with them. She was given away as a piece of property. She's an unwilling victim in this entire story. She's most likely in her early 20s. This is 10 years later from that moment, by the way. Um, so she probably would have been, who knows, 12 years old, um, maybe even a little younger, and she's handed over, so now she's pretty young. She's a, uh, a slave girl far from home, forced into Abram's bed, forced to give birth to Abram's child, and now hated by her own master, Abram's wife, Sarai. But had it not been for Sarai and Abram's sinful failure to trust God, this Bible story would not even exist. In fact, Ishmael was never even supposed to be born. He was the consequence of Abram's sin. But even though Sarai and Abram knowingly and willingly sinned against God, pay very close attention to how God responded to Hagar's situation. I love this part of the story. God saw Hagar who, by the way, was not even a Hebrew child of God, but God saw her anyway, and God loved and blessed Hagar and Ishmael anyway. <laughs> I love that. You know, we always like to tend to think that just because we've done something wrong um, or we're a victim of someone else's wrongdoing or whatever, that God doesn't see us. He saw a victim, not even one of his own children, and he blessed her anyway. Now, granted, that child has been a, you know, a thorn in the world's flesh for over 4,000 years. But think about that. Just because you have done something wrong against God does not mean God will stop seeing you. God sees everything good and bad. And God still loves you, good or bad. What an amazingly awesome promise that we find in this name of God, El Roy. I love that. Because we all have done something wrong. No one here is perfect. We're all sinners. Hopefully we're all sinners saved by grace, but we're all sinners. And, and every week I, I share kind of a personal story about how important names are. Well, many moons ago, while I was still working as a bicycle patrol officer at that university campus in North Carolina, I met and started dating a young woman among many. But anyway, uh, about two months of dating this young woman, true story, she's, I'm telling my hand up, she sat down and she asked me, Roy, what is my name? 
Now, I, I ain't making this stuff up. Quite embarrassingly, I was then forced to admit that even though I had been dating this girl for two whole months, I had no idea what her name was. I, I, I didn't. I, I, I had no idea. I, I've been trying to sneakily find it out, but she wouldn't leave her, her uh, driver's license around for me to check, so I had no idea what her name was. Two months we dated, and I didn't even know her name. Now, how does that apply to this? You know, for I don't know how many years, some of you may have heard the name Elroy before. Some of you may have not. It doesn't matter whether you know God's, all these Bible names of God or not. No matter what, God still sees you. That girl, we stayed together for a little while. Um, I don't know how, I don't remember how much longer after. We did, you know, we dated for a while. Even though I didn't know her name, she still dated me. I mean, well, who can blame her? We're talking about me. Um, so of course she would. But just because you didn't, don't know God's name or you can't speak Hebrew, who cares? God still sees you, period. God sees you. Christ Jesus promised that he will not only see us, but he will never leave nor forsake us either. Because as God loves Christ Jesus, so does Christ Jesus love us. And we know that God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What an amazingly awesome promise that is. That no matter where we are, no matter what we are going through, no matter how rough or tough our troublesome trials and terrible tribulations may be, God still sees us. God sees us. I, I, I love that. There have been times when I have felt that maybe God didn't see me. I wanted to just cry alone in a dark corner somewhere. But God sees you and me. There's an old song um, which uh, I may or may not sing. I don't know. I always have difficulty with it. But does my Jesus care when my heart is stressed? Well, I know that my Jesus, he sees and he cares. When my pillow's wet from the tears that I done wept, well, I know that my Jesus cares. Oh, yes, my Jesus cares. Oh, yes, well, I just know my Jesus cares. Oh, yes, my Jesus cares. Well, I know that my Jesus cares. Friends, Jesus sees and he cares. Amen. Brother Priest, will you please?